Hello. So we'll be doing something a little different because I'm going to take you on a trip to the zoo. It's a zoo with monkeys, with rhinoceroses, and an aquarium. More specifically, there will be spider monkeys, German rhinoceroses, they're called Nashorn, and squirrel fish. So you probably guessed it, I'll be talking about JavaScript engines. JavaScript has gotten incredibly fast. So we look at how JavaScript engines work under the hood and their optimization techniques. I'll show you a few examples of how you can write code that takes advantage of those optimizations rather than working against them. I won't focus on the differences between the engines. Instead, we'll look at what they have in common. So the optimization examples work independently of the browser choice. So a little bit of history. Um, SpiderMonkey is the JavaScript engine that was first, the very first JavaScript engine. It was written in 1995. Back then, it was used in Netscape Communicator. And after several rewrites, that's the engine that we have in Firefox today. Of course, SpiderMonkey comes with monkey friends. So there are TraceMonkey, JaegerMonkey, OdinMonkey, and IonMonkey. And they all help SpiderMonkey to be even faster. Then in 2002, the next animal, Squirrelfish, um, that's the code name for JavaScript core, was written. It's the JavaScript engine in Safari and WebKit. We also have Nashorn. As I already said, Nashorn is the German word for rhinoceros, so it's a word play on, on Reno. It's a JavaScript engine written in Java by Oracle so that you can run JavaScript in a JVM. So the next animal, I'm sorry, I mean engine, is V8, that's the JavaScript engine in Chrome, and Node.js runs on it. That came out in 2009. And Microsoft's JScript, or Chakra, is also one of the older ones. It came out in 1996, and that's what we have in Internet Explorer and Edge. OK, so you already noticed with V8 and JScript, I ran out of animals. And actually, that's already the end of our trip to the zoo. So that was a trick to lure you in here. But sadly, for the rest of the talk, there won't be any more animals. Instead, let's have a look at the technical side. Um, as I already mentioned, those engines have all been rewritten several times. And that was mainly done for performance, because we want fast JavaScript. Obviously, we want our websites to be fast and responsive, so we need good performance. So how fast are we? Um, here are some benchmarks over the last 10 years for different browsers on the SunSpider benchmark. And as you can see, the score got higher because we got faster and faster. OK, so are we fast yet? We got faster. There's a website, arewefastyet.com. And you sort of see similar pictures. So another benchmark over the last two years, different versions of Chrome and Firefox. And as you can see, they got faster. Massive performance, performance improvements. All right. So, Yes, we are faster, but we are faster compared to an older version of ourselves. So does that actually mean we are fast? We are faster than 20 years ago. OK, but are we fast? Well, let's compare to something where we know that it really is fast. Let's have a race between C++ and JavaScript, because we know C++ is fast. So the contenders are C++ and JavaScript. And the racetrack are prime numbers. A basic example, I want to compute the first 25,000 prime numbers and see how fast is JavaScript compared to C++. So on the left, you have C++. On the right, you have JavaScript. Don't worry. Uh, you don't need to read through the algorithm. I just want to, to give you a quick idea. It's, it's fairly short. It easily fits on a page. And the C++ and JavaScript code they, they do the same thing, same algorithm. OK, so when I run this with C++, um, I first print out the 25,000th prime number, which is that one, to make sure my algorithm is correct. And it took me a little bit over 6 seconds, so 6.2 seconds. So how did JavaScript do? So I ran this using D8. That's the debugging shell for V8. It makes it really easy to time it. Um, I ran the prime number example in JavaScript. 
I get the correct answer, so that's good. And it's barely slower than C++, 6.7 seconds. So if you do the math, JavaScript is less than 14% slower than C++. Um, I think this is really amazing. Those are amazing numbers, because what, what's so special about this? Why is it surprising that JavaScript can calculate prime numbers almost as fast as C++? Well, C++ is statically typed. Before you run your code, you have to specify for every variable what type it is. So even at compile time, the compiler knows exactly what it, will, what it will get. It knows it will get an integer or a string or what kind of class it gets. So before runtime, you can optimize the machine code that you get, and then you get really fast code once you actually execute it. JavaScript is dynamically typed. We don't have this information. Only at runtime do we know what we get. So we cannot generate optimized code ahead of time. And um, just to make sure here, I did compile C++ with the minus 03 optimization flag enabled. If, if you leave that out, if you don't optimize your code when compiling, JavaScript would be way faster than the C++ version of this. So this is ahead of time, optimized code in, in C++, and it's just a little bit faster than JavaScript. OK, so in the next 20 minutes, we'll look at what JavaScript engines are doing to get to this massive performance. So a little bit of background. Uh, your classic compiler has those four components. There's a lexer, so you take your source code, and the lexer gives you tokens. Then the parser parses those tokens and generates the abstract syntax tree. And then the translator translates that tree into bytecode. And then the bytecode is interpreted. And there's basic mainly two types of compilers. There's ahead of time compilation and just in time compilation. So when you can do when you when your compiler is an ahead of time compiler, that means before you run it, you compile everything. If possible, you, you optimize the machine code that you get, and then you run it. So obviously, C++ is ahead of time. Why do I say obviously? Well, you have to do two separate steps. You really first call the compiler, which gives you an executable, and then in a separate step, you call the executable. So you have a clear separation of compile time and, and run time. Um, so the, the benefit of ahead of time compilation is you can take your time to optimize this code to get really good machine code. So when you run it, it's very fast. Now JavaScript, on the other hand, uses a just in time compiler. So we're not compiling everything upfront ahead of time. For once, that would not be great if you open a website and you have to wait for all the JavaScript code to compile before anything starts. And also, since it's dynamically typed, we could not generate ahead of time good machine code. So we do it just in time. This is sometimes also called lazy compilation, because we only compile what we need as we want to execute it. OK, so this is good, because we don't have a lot of information ahead of time, so we do just in time compilation. But usually, just-in-time compilation is very slow. You don't have the big picture. You can't optimize. So the, the machine code you get does not run very fast. So how do we get this almost C++ performance if we're using just-in-time compilation? Well, the, the basic concept that all modern JavaScript engines use are hidden classes. So we don't have classes in JavaScript, at least not until ECMAScript 216. But we didn't have classes until then. Um, but behind the scenes, the JavaScript engines assign a type or a hidden class to any object. So integers and strings obviously have different types or different hidden classes. But also objects have hidden classes. So and the, um, I'm going to use this example to explain to you how the engine in the background assigns those hidden classes. So I have a constructor function here for a point that takes two arguments and assigns them to x and y. So when I instantiate a new point A, my engine creates a point object. It is a pointer. And now when I look at the constructor, 
the engine says, OK, so this point object has a hidden class. Let's call it z0. So my point object has class z0. Now, as I go through the constructor, and I am assigning the member variable x some value, the engine in the background is saying, oh, OK, if I take z0 and I add an x to it as the first member, then I'm getting a new hidden class. Let's call it c1. So c1 is the hidden class that comes out of z0 if you add the member x to it. And in z1, at offset 0, you have the value for x. OK, as so we go on in the constructor, we do the same thing for y. So now we take c1, which already has the x at offset 0, and we add y to it. So from z1, we get another hidden class, c2, and it has two offsets, 0 and 1, where x and y are in. So our, our point object A now has hidden class C2, which we get by adding an x and then adding a y. So if we instantiate another point, the compiler goes through the same steps, but it can reuse C0, Z1, and C2. And in the end, both A and B will have hidden class C2, which makes sense. They are very similar objects. We generate it the same way, and we probably want them to be treated the same way later at runtime. Um, if we change the order of assigning x and y, for example, or if we assigned another member variable, then those two objects would not have the, the same hidden class. So the order is important, and then also they need to have the same member variables. Um, with the 8, it's kind of neat whenever you're not sure if two objects have the same hidden class, you can easily check. So if you pass in the flag allow native syntax, then you can call have same map to check if two objects really have the same hidden class. So if, if that was confusing with the order, or if you're not sure if two things are the same, this is how you can check. So I instantiate A and B. Uh, both have an X and a Y, and they have the same hidden class. Now, if I add another variable to A, then they don't have the same hidden class anymore. So in, in practice, that means you want the same objects to have the same hidden class, so it's good practice to always instantiate all your members in the constructor function. So rather do this, where in the constructor function you set x and y, than this. So initialize all object members in constructor functions. OK, so we figured out in the background the compiler is always keeping track of stuff and adding hidden classes. Um, how does this make us faster? So far, we're just doing extra work. Well, those hidden classes are the basis for inline caching. So inline caching is what gives us a, a big performance boost. Um, and what it does is we are caching a function for its most common hidden class. So say we have a function do something of A. When we want to execute it, we compile it into machine code, and into machine code for anything that looks like an A, anything that has the hidden class of A. And now we cache that machine code. So the next time we come across do something, rather than compiling it again for everything that looks like a B, we just check if A and B are similar. If they have the same hidden class, then we can use that code that we already generated. So if A and B have the same hidden class, we don't have to do all this extra work. Only if B is different from A in the sense that they don't have the same hidden class, well, then we have to recompile, generate the machine instructions, and probably cache that version then for later use. So what, what does this mean in practice? Um, I have a silly function twice here. It takes an argument A and returns A plus A. So if I call twice, on a string, I expect the string concatenated with itself. If I call it on an integer, I get twice that value. OK. So now I'm calling twice a million times in a loop, and I'm calling it randomly, either on an integer or on a string. So every other time, I'm calling twice on an int, or I call twice on a string. Now, for a million times, this takes about six seconds. I'm changing this a little bit. Instead of twice, I'm making two functions, twice string and twice int. They're exactly the same functions as twice. They get an argument, and they return a plus a. But my intention with the name is that I call twice string only on strings, and twice int only on integers. 
And then again in the loop, a million times, I randomly call twice string on A or twice int on 4. So the output modulo the randomness is exactly the same as of my program before. I'm just calling A plus A on ints or on strings. But I call two separate functions. So let's look at how long this takes. The first example took five seconds. And this one only takes, sorry, the first one took six seconds, but this one with the two functions, it only takes five seconds. So we have about a 20% speed up. It's not great, but it's, it's, it's a speed up, so that's good. Um, in, the first fun in the first example where we only had one function, that function is called a polymorphic function because the parameter it gets, they come in different shapes, polymorphic. They come as ints or as strings. In the second example, the, the faster one, both functions are considered monomorphic because they always get the same input. The twice string always only got strings. So as takeaway, monomorphic functions are better than polymorphic functions. Don't switch up the type of your parameters. Okay. Here's a disclaimer, though. So I'm talking about optimization, but Donald Knuse already in 1974 wrote in his paper that premature optimization is the root of all evil. So the things I'm telling you, yes, they are faster, but please don't go home and change all your polymorphic functions. Um, in the example I just had, I ran it a million times, and I got about a second faster. So probably your application is not calling anything a million times. And um, if you go and change your polymorphic functions, you probably won't see any speed up overall. The only thing that might happen is that you introduce bugs by typos or other mistakes. So as always, when we talk about optimization, make sure you really understand your application, you profile it, and then optimize the bottlenecks. Don't blindly optimize. OK, so our JavaScript engine, the compiler is a just-in-time compiler that's getting a little faster by using hidden classes and inline caching. That's not quite the speed that we saw in the C++ example. So the trick that all modern JavaScript engines use is that they have at least two just-in-time compilers. They have a regular just-in-time compiler, and they have an optimized just-in-time compiler. So what happens here is, just as before, we go through our uh, tokens, abstract syntax tree, bytecode, and then pass it on to the just-in-time compiler, which does it work, its work, but now it's profiling. And it, when it realizes that it's running a function a lot of times, it says, oh, this is a hot function because we're running it a lot, and the optimized just-in-time compiler should take over. So for any function that's being run a lot, the optimizing just-in-time compiler generates faster machine code for that. So anything that's run a lot can be executed faster. But you see there is a back arrow going back from the optimized to the regular just-in-time compiler. Well, this happens if the optimized compiler has um, written machine code for a function, and all of a sudden we call this function with a different hidden class. Then we can't use the machine code, and instead we fall back, we have to go back to the old, slower, just-in-time compiler. So in V8, the optimized compiler is called Crankshaft, was added in 2010. In Microsoft's Chakra, they call it a full just-in-time compiler. Squirrelfish has not one, but two just-in-time compilers, so DFG and FTL. FTL is not faster than light, it's fourth tier LLVM. And SpiderMonkey has IronMonkey, which helps it for better performance. And another thing that a lot of compilers do is they leave out that step of uh, translating into bytecode. That gives you also a little bit of performance boost. OK, let's look at this twice example again, this time with the optimized compiler turned on. So minus minus crankshaft, that's actually the default option. Earlier on, I had it explicitly turned off. But now let's have the optimization on. So the same examples as before, polymorphic and monomorphic functions. Let's see how fast that is. OK, so we went from 6 and 5 seconds down to 1 second. That's already good. That's a 5, 6 time speed up. But for the monomorphic function, we see an even better speed up. So we are down to 90 milliseconds now. So with modern engines, if you 
by default use the optimized just-in-time compilers, this really makes it faster. And we can nicely see what's going on here when we call the monomorphic example, the faster one, with minus minus trace optimization. Then you see that after a while, we're optimizing twice string, because twice string is always called with a string, so we can optimize it, and the optimizing compiler can now handle this. And the same for twice int. In the other example, with the polymorphic function, we don't see this optimization. The optimizations you see here are for random and the main loop. So in the, monomorph in the polymorphic example, crankshaft never really kicks in, so we don't have this massive speed up. Um, there's another neat thing. If, if we run twice, always on an integer. We always call it on, on four. And only after 10,000 loop iterations, we call it on a string. Then we see the following. So since we're all, always calling it on an integer, yes, we can optimize it, so optimizing twice. But then we get to the 10,000th one, and we're running it just once with a string. But that forces the compiler to throw out this optimized version of twice when it's called with an integer. Because all of a sudden, you cannot use that machine code that you've generated. Okay. So take away, monomorphic functions are better than polymorphic functions. A few more things to avoid are try-catch statements. Anything with eval, so V8 says, oh, I'm not optimizing that at all. Squirrel monkey can do it a little bit, but only the simple examples. Avoid with. Don't do switch statements with more than 128 cases. They can't be optimized <laughs> or maintained. If you have four in loops, keep your keys local, so don't forget the var in front of it. And don't leak your arguments or assign to them. If you use any of that, that'll really slow down your code because you can't use the optimizing compiler. So here's an example of the Fibonacci series. And Jennifer already mentioned the Fibonacci series earlier again. It's a sequence of numbers that starts off with one, one, and you get the next number always by adding the last two numbers. So the algorithm is for the Fibonacci number of n, you just have to add the Fibonacci number of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci number of n minus 2. So we have this nice recursive algorithm, and um, I stop the recursion when n is smaller than 2 because the first two entries are 1 and 1. Okay, so we wrote the algorithm, but for some reason we left an eval 2 plus 2 in there. But it's after the return statement. It, it really shouldn't change anything. But now, when I run this code for n equals 35, I can see that the compiler says disabled optimization reason function calls eval. So just because I had this line in there that didn't change anything about the algorithm, we can't optimize it, and it takes about four seconds. OK, let's go ahead and fix that, remove that line. Um, it's after the return, so it really doesn't change the code. Let's run it again. So we went from four seconds to 200 milliseconds. And uh, if you put the flag trace optimization in, you see optimizing Fibonacci function. It's a nice recursive function, always called on integers. Works perfectly fine with the optimizing compiler. So from four seconds to 200 milliseconds, that's a big speed up. Okay, but remember this here? Don't prematurely optimize. Let's look at this example again. So for every n, we have to add the Fibonacci number of n minus 1 and n minus 2. That actually means if we increase n by just 1, we're doubling the effort. So we have exponential complexity. No, that's not what we want. But this example is good, because we can really easily change this algorithm. So a simple trick is just remember the Fibonacci numbers you've already calculated. I'm saving them in the array A. And whenever you have already calculated one, use that instead of recompiling, recalculating it all the time. So we have linear complexity instead of exponential complexity. Let's look at how fast this is. 
So the exponential example when we deleted eval was down to 200 milliseconds or 180. In the linear example where we just fixed the algorithm a little bit, I didn't even bother to take eval out, so that's actually the slower version. That only took 67 mic microseconds. So remember, when you want to do optimizations, don't blindly optimize for the compiler. Make sure you know your bottleneck and fix your algorithms or whatever else is wrong. <coughs> so as we saw in this example, JavaScript is almost as fast as native C++ code, which is amazing considering that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language where you can't do a ahead of time compilation. And since the compilers rely heavily on hidden classes and inline caching, your application works best if it's statically typed in nature. So try to avoid polymorphic functions. Make several functions that are monomorphic instead. Use constructor in initialization so you make sure that all your objects do have the same hidden class if they're the same kind of object. And also avoid things like evals so that you don't stop the optimizing compiler. Thank you. If you have any questions, come find me. I look forward to talking to you. <laughs>